Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of SEC Roundup. My name is Nick Morgan with the law firm of Paul Hastings. And with me this morning, as always, is my partner, Tom Zaccaro in the Investigations and White Collar Defense Group. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Nick. Also joining us today as our special guests are our partners at Paul Hastings in the New York office, Ken Breen and Farah Gurun. Uh, good morning to you both. Good morning. Thank you. Hello. So we're here to talk about an incredible victory you secured in the Federal Court of Appeals. And rather than my describing it, why don't we let you describe the case and describe some of the challenges that uh, you faced along the way in getting this incredible victory. Ken, can you start us off? Great. So the case involved a scheme to uh, allegedly manipulate uh, the LIBOR submissions and, and, and therefore the, the LIBOR rates uh, by uh, our client, who is a, a, a desk manager in, in New York and a, a derivatives trader in London. And they were charged in, in a overarching conspiracy involving the bank, uh, several cooperating witnesses, our clients, uh, went to trial. Uh, we won five of eight charges. Um, we had three remaining. They went to sentencing. A government asked for 15 years in jail. Um, our client received a sentence of six months home detention and uh, we proceeded to appeal the three remaining accounts of conviction and we won in the second circuit uh, judgments of acquittal on a sufficiency basis so with a case like this the one of the main challenges was both uh, explaining a complicated concept uh, to the jury while creating a pristine appellate record just in case, which which was required here, the, no. um, the the simple version, the superficial version of of, of the facts was, was on the government side. So it was up to us to provide the details and, and to dig down and, and to uh, pull out the information we, we needed, you know, both at trial and and, and at, at appeal on issues in, in involving falsity, falsity of, of the submissions, and separating the falsity issues from the intent issues. I mean, the holding of the court, the second circuit was, was, was basically that, that they didn't prove falsity and they, and they couldn't prove falsity by uh, presenting uh, testimony from the cooperative witness as, as to you know, their personal feelings that, that the conduct was wrong or, or unfair. And uh, we separated that element out and, and uh, in the cross-examination of the cooperative witnesses ma made clear that the submissions that the uh, submitters were making on behalf of the bank were, were being made in a reasonable range that was consistent with with the LIBOR definition and, and uh, you know by doing that you know we we, we didn't carry the day completely at, at, at trial with the jury or the district court judge uh, but in the second circuit uh, you know, there was a firm ruling pushing back uh, in, in really uh, a repudiation of, of the, the superficial um, look at, at if you know that it must automatically be false if, if a if a, a, a trader or, or a, a desk manager asked for a, an adjustment of, of the submission uh, based on derivative submission. And, and, that, and that was, uh, I would say, the main challenge of the case. So it sounds like a, a significant, huge victory. Um, what do you think this means for future uh, market manipulation or similar cases and the government's uh, burden of proof in those cases? So the Second Circuit put language in the opinion that said something along the lines of federal fraud statutes are not universal catch-alls. And I think that that's what the government has really been trying to do for the past decade or longer and trying to put these cases all into some wire fraud or securities fraud framework that they really don't fit into. And this is, to me, creating a putting a big burden on the government and making sure that they separate out every element and not try to conflate intent and falsity and, and even falsity and materiality, that there, there are separate elements that need to be addressed separately. And something is not false merely because some it felt wrong to a, a cooperator. Yeah, just to add to that, the um, it, it really prevents the government from, in, in any federal fraud statute, whether it be wire, mail, uh, bank, securities fraud, with, with, with uh, taking an opinion with regard to the morality or, or, or the fairness of, of, of certain conduct and turning it into a federal crime. The, um, and it, it, it 
really requires a, 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 a more specific uh, set of, of evidence, you know, to, to put together that, that proof. And it's an important safeguard. I, I think this is uh, really going to be a, 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 an often cited case on, on, on that topic, not just in wire fraud, but in all the federal uh, property charges that, 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 you know, could be brought. So the, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, also in separating out intent for, from falsity, clearly that's something that, that is, uh, is key. And it is consistent with uh, some of the, the case law we've, we've seen, you know, with, with USB Kelly, with the Bridgegate, uh, with, uh, you know, the, the uh, USB Gibson case in, in Wilmington on, on falsity and, and, uh, and now USB Conley. Well, thank you both very much for your overview. This is uh, an incredible win. Congratulations. It sounds like it's going to have impact well beyond uh, the parties in this case. So we'll look forward to see how that plays out. Uh, and everybody else, uh, please join us again for the next episode of SEC Roundup. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Fair.